Next, we follow along to discover the history and impact of the Milo Grogan neighborhood. That's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're at the center of the Milo Grogan neighborhood, a once thriving community that prospered through the Civil War, but struggled during the redlining home sale restrictions of the 1950s and 60s. Milo Grogan is a prime example of a nearly forgotten neighborhood that's ripe for rejuvenation. And this is where historians do some of their most exciting work by gathering evidence so that residents can take pride in the past and make plans for the future. We wanted to show you the process of documenting the history of a neighborhood by following historian Doreen Yuha Sauer on her rounds. And this story is special because she's enlisted a class from Fort Hayes High School so the students can be part of the lasting legacy of this early Columbus neighborhood. It's a fascinating process that rarely travels in a straight line. Teaching history is really like taking a journey, except instead of getting on the road and going from one place and getting at the other place and then you're over and done with, it's not. It's stopping and starting and stopping and starting and going back. And so when you're teaching local history, you take advantage of the things you can grab onto that are tangible and then you sometimes wind up going backwards to re-explain where did that come in the journey. And you are always moving in a not very linear process but in a wonderful, wonderful whirlwind of what all of these places and people are about. And when you're close to being done, that's when you really say, wow, we did something wonderful. Where is Fort Hayes on here? This one, okay. Ah, you can always find the U.S. barracks. So where would Milo Grogan be? The students at Fort Hayes are working on a oral history project of Milo Grogan, which is the nearest neighborhood to the school. Look at this long, dark line here. What is this down here? It all seems to be ending at. Union Depot. That's the old Union Station. That's where people came in and out of on trains, and at one point, there were 159 passenger trains a day that came into Columbus. This is gonna be a big area of employment. I'm hoping to learn more about my community because, you know, I don't know a lot about it, and I think that's a shame. The Milo Grogan neighborhood has an interesting history. There were two little communities located along Cleveland Avenue. The name Milo is still a bit of a mystery. Uh, we don't know if it was named that specially by a developer, or there was some discussion always that it stood for Mile Zero, meaning an early post office. One of the main attractions to the neighborhood at the time was the post office, surprisingly. At evenings where they get the letters and their mail, it was a gathering spot for many of the individuals. Grogan was a grocer, had a grocery, and Grogan has just about all but disappeared. Grogan was on the other side of Fifth Avenue. The neighborhood is Irish, African American, and Italian. So the roots are just wonderfully rich. Come over, they don't know where Milo is. The Fort Hayes campus often served as an unofficial playground or a green space to the younger children of Milo. The relationship between the two, they shared a lot of experiences and some of the same issues in the past 100 years, such as urbanization, industrialization, a human history. 
we were given 10 boards and they basically depicted a map of Columbus once you put it all together. There was more houses, more activity, more things that aren't here today. There was a lot of pool halls, grocery stores, shoe stores, and then football began forming a lot. It was, became a popular sport for young men. The men worked in the railroads and they would play baseball and football and they were able to like use the trains to play other teams in West Virginia and that's how we got our NFL. At Marlo Grogan there were a lot of employment opportunities because of the Temkin factory that was in the area who were a big supplier of weapons for World War II but also during this time they employed over 3,000 uh, Marlo Grogan residents and were considered the largest employer in the country. The Irish neighborhood had a nickname called Goose Town and it was because they would use the goose feathers to make the beds there, and there would be feathers all over the town. One group was looking at these small multiple listing cards, and this is the old-fashioned way of marketing houses in Columbus between 1950 and 1970. And when you turned them over, the things you learned were amazing. You could find houses that had been long gone, which were from the 1840s. You could find neighborhoods turning around in a moment as freeways came through or migration patterns that were changing and Italian neighborhoods became African-American neighborhoods and trying to find, without a lot of prompting, what do you learn from these cards? They quickly picked up on the fact that houses became commercial along Cleveland Avenue. They're not sure why yet, you know, you have to kind of fill in the blank. Do you see how that house it has kind of an L shape to it. That is almost certainly an old farmhouse, like you would have found out in the country. If you look at the other houses there, that becomes the next style of architecture that's coming in, called four square houses, because they look like big four squares. But then it's gonna do exactly what this guy did, and that's gonna become rental because there's just so much there that people can't keep it up. Sometimes there's a house and it looks like the business grew out of the front porch. People often didn't have cars. They took streetcars. And the streetcars are running up Cleveland Avenue. And where there's a stop, somebody gets the idea that, you know what? They're going home. They need a loaf of bread. They need some milk to take to the kids. I'm going to open the downstairs of my house, like a little grill or a little grocery store and that's why there are so many grocery stores. And if you look in the city directories, it's like every other person was opening a grocery store. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people might want to sell a house fast. They're trying to move in with children, downsize. It may be houses aren't selling and people aren't being able to get mortgages or bank loans. It also may mean that uh, in that particular year, and it's before 1970, Whoever wants that house is going to have a hard time getting a loan from the bank because they're not white. That's just the plain, simple part of it. How do you get that mortgage if the bank is not going to help you? So what's the last line on the one thing there? In the remarks it says the two houses can be sold colored or commercial corner. Okay, two houses can be sold colored or commercial corner. Okay, commercial corner is pretty obvious. You can make a business, right? But what is colored or commercial corner? property. They, what can is, sell they can sell to African Americans. Why would you put that on the back of a card? At the time it wasn't. At the, the, you're right, at the time it's not. It's telling us that the neighborhood is no longer probably predominantly white. Civil rights time, Kennedy is president. There is no federal legislation that says that you can buy a house wherever you want. That will not come until the 1970s. So every piece of property around Columbus, if you were not white, was a struggle to get. World War I through World War II, the Italian families came and migrated near St. Clair Avenue. They started going to church at St. Peter's Church. The nice thing about teaching local history is that there's no book. And you have to start matching faces and places. And really, the faces are the more important. Who are these people? What do they know about their community? What can they lead you to? So we were very lucky to be able to discover someone who could tell us more about the early Italian community. My grandmother's brother had been brought to Pennsylvania by the Pennsylvania Railroad because he had learned to speak English. 
They brought him there so he could talk to the other Italian boys that would come. Mm -hmm. And railroads were very, very important to Columbus. The biggest roundhouse between Pennsylvania and Chicago was right here in Columbus. And my father was a boilermaker on the railroad. And this is a picture of the crew. And that happens to be my father that we circled his face. This is the first house that my grandparents lived in. You can see back here on this side, that's where the Pennsylvania Railroad shops were. So they built the house right here so that they could walk to work. And this was the NNW. So in the neighborhood, there were a lot of railroaders. They either worked for the NNW or they worked for the Pennsylvania. My uncle left the NNW then, and he started a bar right at the gate of the Pennsylvania Railroad shops called the Friendly Grill. And all the railroaders would go there for lunch and <laughs> go there to cash their checks when they got paid. And my aunt was the cook. That was another thing about Old Milo. You know, on St. Clair Avenue, there were four grocery stores, and we all made a good business. There was Fracasso's, DePaulo's, DePetro's, and our store. And then once a year in September, the Pennsylvania Railroad would bring in card loads of grapes, and then they would distribute them down the street, and in front of all the houses you would see the grape boxes for everybody to make their wine. This was the original football team in the neighborhood, the St. Clair Clothiers, and they won the state championship. And my father was very popular with the football team because he had this first Auburn car, so he would pick up the players and drive them to the football games on the weekends. Your father was a big fan of cars. Oh, yes. And before that, it was motorcycles. Because when they first came from Italy, a lot of those young boys didn't have enough money to buy a car. But they did have money to buy motorcycles. And this one, in fact, I took it out of my mother's album and it's got written St. Clair Avenue. A lot of prominent businesses that still exist in Columbus were started by people that lived in Milo. You see the big company around town called Corna and Coco Singh, well, Mr. Corna, dear old Angelo Corna, he was the dearest old man, and he was the original stonemason in Milo. So it was the people that made Milo so special. Absolutely. It was really fascinating. It was almost like a trip back in time to just live through someone's life and hear all the stories and the way they grew up. In putting together faces and places, we were invited to the Fifth Third Bank, to the eighth floor, to meet with Mr. Jordan Miller and his friend Bobby Johnson, who had grown up in the Milo Grogan neighborhood. When we lived there, we still had teachers that lived in the neighborhood. We had um, doctors that lived in the neighborhood, and lawyers that lived in the neighborhood. Everybody lived in, everybody was black lived in the neighborhood. Black people didn't live anywhere else but around each other. And so it was, it was different during those days, so we were pretty tight-knit. Were either of you guys in the um, boys' club when you were little? We had to. I mean, I, that's a given. That's, I mean, what was it, 25 cents or 50 cents? Oh, yeah, it was pretty cheap, yeah. We could, always, we could always muster up 50 cents. My dad worked there, so after school, go there, do your homework, right. and play basketball. Everybody could run wild. I couldn't because my dad would come in, and I, <laughs> okay, I had to go to wood shop. <laughs> Remember that White Castle? That's right. I remember my cousin came up from West Virginia. I said, hey, man, I'm going to take you for the treat of your life. <laughs> I walked over. I think, I can't remember what they were. They're like 14 cents or maybe. Five for 25 cents. Oh, yeah, five for 25. Five for 25. And we get these white castles. Then we went by Milo Grogan School. So we were sitting over there getting ready to crash into these birds. He took one bite and he spit it out. I said, what's up? He said, I can't eat onions. I said, okay, give me those things, man. <laughs> I think what inspired me that he was talking about was that he was recalling things from his childhood, going to the Boys and Girls Club to play basketball. He recalled when his family would talk about the five for a dollar white castles. It was things like that that reminded me of my own home. The parents really worked together. All up and down that alley, <laughs> everybody knew you. There was no place to hide. So, And anybody had the right to discipline you. You know, nobody really needed discipline because we really weren't too many bad kids. And then we played together. It was just epitome of teamwork. And everybody participated. And when somebody made a mistake on the field, nobody called them out. You learned how to get along with people, is what I say. And you learned how to communicate with people. And you learned how to put up with other people's personalities. So it was all great lessons. What I took away from the interviews is that it takes family and friends to grow. Like in that community, if somebody was down, another person in the community would help them back up. 
They would feed the other kids in the neighborhood. They would help like with money situations. You have other people to lean on. It's not just you by yourself. We were lucky enough to be able to meet with Jim Clemens, who is a high school star in Columbus, went on to Ohio State, and became a very successful player with the NBA. And he had grown up in Milo Grogan, and he was there with his friend Rodney Kent. My mind takes me back to my auntie and my uncle and my mother. One of the reasons that we left North Carolina, in their mind's eye, was to give, uh, I say, the, the three of us, my sisters and I, a better lot in life. And thank God for my auntie who lived on Mill Avenue because she provided housing for us for that first year. They ultimately moved us to 857 and gave us stability and that was the beginning of our roots here. I wanted to um, introduce these cards. You might be familiar with them and I wanted to see if you remember any of the buildings or any of the structures in there. Oh yeah, that's that one I do remember. Grinding and welding were very popular kinds of things to have shops. I remember there was a little welding shop close to my house. I do remember this cleaners. To take your clothes to the dry cleaners in those days, you, you, you know, it was a special piece of cloth, <laughs> you know, you, the, your Sunday clothes, otherwise you washed them. I think you guys have done some really nice research in finding some of these old pictures. The Milo Grogan area was a, a very strong Italian community. And as we began to move into it, diversity. You hear a lot of people talk about diversity. We learned the understandings of what diversity represented because unlike what most people say, the reception that I received and the things that I did and the places that I could go in this community in Milo Grogan were very warmly received because of the Italian community that was here and diversity was very important. I mean, I need you to understand diversity because you could learn things and you could experience things. As coaches, we've always talked about what it means to be a team. You might be great individuals, but you may be even better as a team working together. And you all have different views and concepts, but when you become a team, you become powerful when the mindset of the team is one. And if you do your best every day at everything that you attempt to do, success is gonna come your way. It will. You're not gonna win all the time. But you're gonna win a lot more than you lose because you do your best. That's what you owe to yourself. I saw a lot of passion and a lot of determination. I just felt like I could do anything. It made me feel like nothing's impossible and I'm more than happy to just see that manifested in people who live beyond my time and to know more than me because I'm always learning more and it just tells me that nothing's impossible and I have limitless potential. We had studied the neighborhood through our use of maps and talking about things, so it was important to get the students on a bus to see what Cleveland Avenue looked like, and what were the boundaries, and what was the housing stock like. When this is an army base in the 1860s, already this is just wooded area owned by Robert Neal and his wife. When the Civil War starts, they decide that they're going to actually sell this to the U.S. government. At first they think they're going to make shot, you know, the little beads that would have been to put in a shotgun, but the technology changes, and instead the shot tower never makes shot. It is actually a place where they repair firearms. And the majority of the work done was actually done by women. Across the way where Ross Labs is, it starts as Ross Dairy. There was a little grocery store that was about here called Ross Grocery. All of these other buildings, this is 1920s, will come in later. This is a Ford Motor Plant. Today it's a Kroger Bakery. And as we travel up here, I want you to know you are on the major route of the Underground Railroad. Cleveland Avenue's original name was Harbor Road. Um, and Harbor Road led all the way out to um, Cleveland, Ohio. Harbor, it can also refer to like shelter or safety because the Underground Railroad conductors, they traveled along that road and they sheltered their fugitive slaves prior to the Civil War. There is a streetcar run by electricity this little building is the Railway Power and Light Company. 
It is a sole survivor from about the late 1880s. You remember that some of the early residents of the neighborhood were Irish and Italian, and many of the Italians that came over were stonemasons and bricklayers. And if you even look at this building, at first glance you might see a building that's in sorry shape and coming down, but look at some of the way the bricks are laid. But it was common to see this fancy brickwork even in workaday pedestrian buildings like this. Usually when you see abandoned houses or you see boarded up buildings, the landlord's probably sitting on the property, not sure what to do with it, but hoping that it will increase in value. And we've seen it all over Columbus, is old neighborhoods that were once very valuable, went into disrepair, and then now are coming back. This area is coming up in value. A lot of people are moving back to the center city because they're tired of driving an hour and a half home, commuting. Now there's been different additions on the school. You can see the different generations of architecture and the original structure is up front. The architect of the school was J.M. Fries, who had just completed the Franklin Park Conservatory. I think this building is such an outstanding architectural gem, but what's really important about it is that it's being repurposed for yet a new use. This is where I live and work, the dogs and I. The Milo Art Space is a wonderful place created in the 1980s. It houses artists and it acts as their studios and workspace. Back there, behind, this is what I call the photo wall is a work area where I frame things. In that room there, what was the coat room, is my kitchen. It's um, sort of submarine-like, but it works. A lot of them have what you would call a studio apartment. There aren't many walls. They have elevated beds where they have to climb up a ladder. Their little kitchens are behind walls. They have a small living space, but a really great big workspace. We met four of the artists and we got to see how they lived life daily. Older people don't want to walk with a cane because it makes them look old or infirmed. Well, this is a perfect example of taking a negative and turning it to positive. When they have these walking sticks, people will run up to them and say, where did you get that? And they don't even notice that they need the cane. A friend of mine who's a poet, she wrote poems with four-year-olds. So this is one of the poems that somebody wrote in this neighborhood. Sit down, world and relax. I think it's wonderful what they have there because you can create a connection, you can get creative ideas from one another. See the houses here and then they stop with the expressway? They'll pick up again on the other side. Imagine houses being there when the expressway wasn't. And then think about what neighborhoods get expressways cut right through them, wealthy neighborhoods or poor neighborhoods? And part of that too is because wealthier people were moving out already. The inner part of the city it was older and so it was easier to get the land and it was more needed where the expressways were going. I would have never thought that those neighborhoods were to get cut, so actually today seeing it up close, neighbors were split apart that were like family to each other. I think today its challenges are being separated and divided and forgotten. When you hear Milo Grogan at first, I didn't know it existed. I think that's their challenges, that they don't have the community anymore. The community has been torn apart by urbanization and the fact that some housing prices are going up, some are dropping down, people are moving out, people are moving in. It's just forever changing. On the other side is Italian Village and then past that is Victorian Village. That's where all of the big apartments and condos and everything are coming up. And that will put this community under a great deal of pressure. Will people sell out cheaply? Will other things be built here? Will any part of the history remain? And in the long run, what you're doing with oral histories is saving some of that before it's being lost, because we really just don't know if it's going to remain or not. I think the neighborhood has going forward is the fact that they're trying to get back on their feet. They're really trying to fix themselves to better themselves, to bring back the pride and joy of the communities. They're trying to connect people.
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. All my life, I've been waiting here for so long to say. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.